If you're using Node.js and haven't secured your app against SSRF, here's why you should worry and what you can do about it. Today, we're diving deep into securing your Node.js applications against server-side request forgery or SSRF. It's a critical topic every Node.js developer needs to master, so let's learn more about it now. First, what is SSRF? Well, as I mentioned before, it stands for server-side request forgery. And it's a vulnerability that allows attackers to send crafted requests from your server to internal systems or external URLs. Why is this so dangerous? Well, because it can lead to information disclosure, internal system access, or manipulation of your internal processes. A real life example of this is when Capital One was breached by an attacker who then used an SSRF vulnerability to get access to 140,000 social security numbers and 80,000 bank account numbers. It resulted in over 100 million people being impacted by the breach and $250 million in damages. US dollars. Yikes. So to better understand SSRF, let's see it in action. I have a demo application up on GitHub. Link will be in the description below so you can check it out yourself and follow along with the video. All right. So I've already cloned and forked the, or forked and cloned the repository to my machine here so that I can run and demonstrate this to you. Now, this is a simple Node.js application that has this one API endpoint that allows me to send a post request and upload an image to that this particular URL. We're going to demonstrate how this is vulnerable to SSRF. Okay. I'm going to run it, which is already running node index.js. And then I'm going to use a REST client that's built into, not built into, but a REST client that's uh, available via an extension in VS Code, the one that I in particular like, this one right here. And the reason is I can just open up a new tab and like send the requests from that tab given a certain type of syntax, which I'm going to show you right now. So really quick, we'll see a basic request where I'm just going to request for Google. I can bring it up via the command pal and say REST client send request like that first option you see there. And then that opens up a second tab here on the right-hand side to show the results of that request. It was a 200 okay. All right, so I'm gonna close my terminal and now I'm gonna show you a basic server-side request forgery attack. So in this case, going back to the server, we're able to just send a image URL and there's no validation or anything happening on there. So we can wanna see if instead of us uploading a file from our system, if we can point this server to go and get a image from another source, in this case, imager. So I'm going to see if this works. If you want, check out little Easter egg there, what that imager points to. It's up to you. I'm going to send requests. I'm going to highlight the request syntax for I, that I want for that particular request and then hit send request. I got a 200 OK. And then I was able to get back the response that everything was uploaded successfully. Uh, and basically the results of that image upload. What's the, the data that came back from the server making that request? So that to me as an attacker is an indication that this URL was permitted and I can try other URLs and start exploring what the server is able to have access to within this website, within this API that I'm that I'm trying to hack. So that's a basic one, right? And I can start traversing things and learning more about that. But then there's ones where you don't have as much information about the server or maybe as a result of doing the basic version of it, you can do what's called a blind SSRF attack, which is where you start exploring what other areas of if, if it can make a request against itself, essentially the server. So in this case, we want to see if we can access any users associated with this application. So I'm going to send this post request now. And now we can see that the image that we uploaded, which was that URL is really just the server making a request to this API endpoint because it has the permissions to itself, of course. And now we got all these credentials back from, let's say the database of this application. We can start using this to our advantage as an attacker. And that is a couple of SSRF examples to show you why it's dangerous and the importance of it. So naturally the next question that comes to mind is how do we stop this from happening? Well, there are five best practices you can use to mitigate SSRF. Number one, it starts with validating and sanitizing user input. As a general principle, you should never trust incoming data, especially URLs that your server will be fetching. This is the main cause for SSRF vulnerabilities. So how do you validate and sanitize URLs? Well, sanitizing involves looking at the data for anything unnecessary or unexpected. And for validation, we can use a library which focuses on doing just that. There are quite a few packages out there, so take your pick. But here is one I've used for URL validation and other data types. It's called Zod. You define the schema for the data, so in this case, a URL, and then use the schema's parse function with the data to check. If the data passes, then it's good to go. Otherwise, you'll receive an error indicating what's wrong with that data. So what you're gonna to wanna to do to get started with Zod is npm install Zod, like that. 
And then once that's good to go, you can start including it in the example project or your own project. You can require it or import it if you'd like. I assign the Z to its own variable. And then I set up the URL schema that I want. And so Z has, I want to make sure it's a string and I want to make sure it's a URL type of string. And then that assigns it to a URL schema object. When a request comes in rather to the post API, I can check that the image URL that's provided in the post uh, is a against that URL schema by using the parse function. And if anything goes wrong with that, it will throw an error and then I'll console log it in, right? So to show an example of this working in action, let's say I make this post request to there now, is this make sure it's running first rather, node index.js. And in this case, I'm gonna send an invalid URL. Like this is not, percent signs are not permitted there. So we're gonna send this request. This is another way you can send it. We can see something went wrong. And if I bring up the console, we could see it saying, hey, uh, invalid URL, right? So now we're doing uh, validation that it is indeed a URL that somebody's trying to send to us. Now you should still be cautious with third-party libraries like Zod or anything else that you use as a dependency as those can introduce their own vulnerabilities, but we'll get more on that later. For now, let's get into the next best practice to prevent SSRF. And that is to enforce URL schema. In some cases, attackers will attempt to submit schemas such as file or FTP, which is likely not something you want to support in your server to be requesting outside of it, right? And instead, you can limit the request URLs to just HTTP or better yet, HTTPS. This can also be done with Zod by using the starts with option when setting up your Zod schema, uh, as you can see here, I'm going to show you right now. So really quick, you can see I just added on to the way I'm defining the schema here on line six, and I'm saying it starts with HTTPS colon slash slash. And that way, if I try to send anything that is not that protocol, uh, or if I receive anything rather, that's not that part protocol, it will throw an error on that as well. Once you have those mitigation techniques in place, you'll want to limit which domains you trust for your server to make requests to. Essentially, you create what's called an allow list of trusted domains, and you check the URL you receive against that list. Here's an example of how that can be done. So to get started using trusted domains, one of, a simple way we can go about doing this is by setting up an array of trusted domains like you can see here on lines 14 through 18. I'm saying unsplash, example, and pexels are trusted domains. And then when I want to, once I get past all the other validation we did, we're going to iterate over those trusted domains and see if the image URL starts with one of those. If it does, then it's true, it passes. If not, it will fail and we'll send a response back that says access to this domain is not permitted, as you see here. Let's make sure it's running. And then we'll come back over here and make a request, set it to localhost this time, which is not a permitted domain. Let's see if we get that result. Access to the domain is not permitted, 403 forbidden. So there you go. That's how you can go about implementing a trusted domain list, allow list for your server to prevent SSRF. Another best practice to prevent SSRF is to use what's called a firewall. A firewall is a network security system that acts as a protective barrier for your systems. It monitors and controls network traffic based on predetermined rules. So to prevent SSRF attacks using firewalls, you can deploy a web application firewall or WAF to inspect and block malicious requests. This is done in a similar way to how we just created an allow list of trusted domains in our code, but now in a firewall application. It then denies any suspicious URLs or IP addresses outside of that allow list from accessing your server altogether. Moving on to the next best practice for preventing SSRF number five, and it's by making sure your dependencies are up to date. I mentioned using one to help with validating URLs earlier and how that could introduce vulnerabilities in itself. And this is where Sneak comes in. With the free account, Sneak can alert you of vulnerabilities in your open source dependencies and show you how to address them all. You can also aid in keeping them up to date automatically if you'd like. As an example, let's say we're using version 1.1.0 of the isURL library to validate the user provided URL. In doing so, we'd introduce a regular expression denial of service vulnerability. How do I know? Because Sneak alerts us to that vulnerability and indicates that we need to upgrade to version 1.2.4 in order to fix it. All right, let's recap what we learned on preventing SSRF in our node applications. Number one, sanitize and validate user input. Number two, enforce URL schemas. Number three, use an allow list in your app. Number four, use a firewall. And number five, keep your dependencies updated. If you have questions or want to share your experiences with SSRF, be sure to comment them down below. That does it for this video. If you got value out of it, be sure to like it down below and share it with a colleague who could put it to use. And if you made it this far, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on upcoming videos. Thanks for watching and happy safe coding everyone.